Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about costumes. I'm not going to talk about designing the costumes themselves. I'm going to talk about uh, the things around it, actually the process of doing and deciding to do costumes for a LARP. Uh, it's not that common in the Nordic countries that we see that the LARP makers provide the costumes. Uh, I've asked several times people why this is. Um, it's easier. Um, it is difficult to understand what it implies and most and most most commonly sizes they are really confusing um, and they are for everyone um, so there is one thing we have to be sure about when we start uh, to do costumes and that is to understand that there is a difference for the participant and for the LARP maker. I'm distinguishing between the LARP designer, the visual aspect of it, and then the practical aspects of actually doing the costumes. I'm talking about not producing them yourselves, but ordering them. Um, there's a difference because for the LARP maker, it is a practical matter. You want to achieve a certain visual design. For the participant, it's much more entwined with their emotions, or it can be at least. And um, why it is important to understand this? LARP is visual. Costumes do play a part in the visual aspects of LARP. Um, to understand and to decide to do the costumes as a LARP maker, is to uh, take in your own hand the experience you want to uh, give or have the players be part of. Um, but you also have to understand that there are, um, because it is emotional for the participant, it might not only be a um, matter of concern when they sign up, it might also uh, affect their game. And it is, when I say this might probably not uh, very groundbreaking, but if you haven't thought about it before, it, it, it might be new in this context. Um, what you might not realize uh, why this is a part uh, of the emotional aspect for, for the participant is that um, if you never had to engage in that, um, points that might be emotional is that you have to take the measurements you might actually have to find help taking the measurements, which means that if you are not very positive, have positive feelings about your size, you might have to include someone else in that process. Even though they might be a friend, it might be scary. And then you have to be confronted with the numbers. You have to look at the numbers because you have to share them with someone who might be your friend again or it might be a complete stranger who might not have emotions tied to the numbers, who just need them for practical reasons, but for the participant, it might be really emotional. It might just be that they know that they are not standard size. I'm not standard size. I'm below the, the norm. And the norm is difficult when it comes to talking about costumes. Because when we talk about costumes, we actually talk about buddies. And to understand what all this is, you have to know that in the 40s and 50s, standardized sizing was introduced to be able to produce uh, clothes in the industry. Um, and this means that when you make a scale, you always have someone who are below and someone who are above and to each side of it. Because we are not scaled uh, very uh, proportionally always. Um, if you ever tried going buying clothes and it is your size, but you just don't fit it, that is basically what's happening. Um, what happened, however, was that um, the sizes didn't change because the manufacturers, they figured out that your worth or the feeling of self-worth is tied to what size you perceive yourself to be. So even though that we grew as most Western countries had a better uh, living standards, the sizes did not. So we have a size inflation. 
Um, and this affects how we are about our bodies and what we do when we talk about them. If there's a norm, you will always have the margins. You will always have issues with saying what is normal, what is typical, big, bigger, small, large. These are all troublesome terms because they point in a direction that there are people outside of the normal scale. And if there is an issue being, not being in the, in the general scale, this will be difficult, uh, or can be difficult for some. Um, but there are ways to go about this. Even though this is emotional, you can build trust. And uh, this is, of course, my experience. Um, as a LARP maker, uh, here the practical aspect of the costumes, if you state your intention to include people of all sizes and shapes, then we have a really good start. And if you plan ahead, if you actually put a bit of thought into it and say, how do you want to go about this? There's a way to talk about this that doesn't become about you, the LARP maker, or the participant, but the plan, which also will help you when you later on need to order clothes uh, and get information from participants on what sizes they need. Um, and one thing that's also really, really important, measuring lists, meaning not sizes. Men's clothes are traditionally um, tied to chest measurement. So if you, there is more, uh, it's more normal to see men's sizes in, that are not small, medium, large, and X amount of Xs, uh, that are numbers. This number will be the me chest measurement, which means that there's not a, a letter or something tied to it, it's just a number. Um, whereas in women's clothes, this isn't the case. There is sizes, uh, small, medium, large, and then more have been added as we have grown and we have started making more adult-looking clothes for kids again. Um, and Another thing that is really good to, to take care of or communicate when you as a LARP maker are doing your plan is that um, who and how and when should the participant contact you. Take care of yourself and make sure that you put a framework on who should they ask these questions so they go to the, uh, the person who actually knows something about it and leave those that might be main organizers who might not have their head into the costumes. Um, and then there is the practical aspects of it. Uh, vanity sizing also has affected how we measure things. It's not that simple as there is measurements. There's two different kinds of measurements, measurement charts. There's body size and there's garment size. It's really important to be aware which one you're looking at. Uh, and this is where it will show whether or not you did your research. Uh, it is usually stated which one it is, because otherwise they will have very, very grumpy customers where you're buying it from. Um, but another thing is that it might also be the issue with this uh, inflation is that it is different throughout the world. And even like if you've ordered anything from China and you are not from the Asian countries, meaning that you are from the Scandinavian countries, you're most likely taller than what they usually produce the clothes for. So you might not fit what you order, even though it, you might have taken into account that you need two sizes larger than what you usually wear. Uh, this means that even from France to Germany, there is, in general, two different... Um, the same size in France is two sizes smaller than it is in Germany. This means that you just have to be alert on where and how you're ordering it. Um, there is, there will, you will most likely also be uh, confronted with fit. There is a uh, classic male fit, which is shoulder and hips. This is generally the easiest because it's simpler than the, the female fit, which is, has a third option, which is chest, hips, and waist. 
but you can't usually put a, uh, a female figure, uh, here I mean a slimmer waist and wider hips, into male or unisex fitting pants, because these are more yeah, straight than the classic female fit. And here you might run into, if you actually think about doing this and plan about it, people who are used to, a concern that people who are usually not within normal scales uh, will have is that you might order something somewhere else to be sure you have it in their size, which means that details might be different. Which means, again, that they might be more, it would be visible at the game that they had to, you had to specially order in for them. This can, th there's th various ways that I, we touch, uh, Shrestha and I, who, who wrote this piece in the book, we touch on, uh, you can find that out there. Um, yeah, let me just, <laughs> um, there are some, I have made a, a small um, alignment here on when you do things. One thing that is, uh, I'm not going to go very much into ordering adjustments. We have more pointers on what you need to consider there, um, delivery times and uh, stand your ground if something isn't as you were promised, uh, getting your money back. Um, but it's, it's worth uh, noting here that the communi communication is for a large part, digital. So when you're talking about talking with people about something that is, uh, to some degree, emotional to them, you're mostly doing it at a point where you don't have um, your body language to rely on when you're talking with them. And this makes it really, really important that you have in mind that the participant will never contact you to be a nuisance. They will never do this. They will either do it because they are, most likely both, because they are anxious and they know that it has previously been uh, a bit troublesome or majorly troublesome for them, which means that if they are out in good time, you can be out in good time. So they might actually help you a great deal by contacting you. But do remember that they're doing this to help you achieve your goal for the visual that you want to. Because th this can, in, in the end, they might have a slightly frustrating or really bad experience with the game because they feel out of sync. It might push them, their, their mind in a different mindset or be too conscious of something so they're not in the game. And what they really want to do is fulfill your vision and be part of it. Um, Yes, that's what I had to say. Thank you so much, Anna.